Thank you. Thank you. Um, good afternoon and thanks uh, for coming. Um, today I'll be talking about uh, video game history, computer game history. Um, and I'll be talking about some differences and similarities between how uh, games are being produced by professional diameters. And in particular, I'm going to look at um, the 1980s, because that's where most of my research um, I mean, in my previous project was. I was looking at the history of computer games in uh, behind the Iron Curtain in 1980s Czechoslovakia. So here you can, you can see a picture of uh, Matthew Smith, a very influential and famous British programmer from the 1980s. And on, on the right, it's, uh, it's uh, Libor Bedelig, who was like an amateur Czech, uh, Czech programmer also from the 1980s. And I'm just using these images to kind of put them one uh, you know, as, uh, beside each other. Uh, they're, they're both young people, but they live in very sort of different contexts, and they were creating games in very different contexts. Um, yeah, as Jan has mentioned, um, a lot of this talk is based on my upcoming book, Gaming the Iron Curtain, which is coming out very soon. Um, but a lot of it is also actually quite new, so the material that I'll be presenting about Manic Miner, a lot of it is new, and it's um, it's based on a chapter that I'm writing for uh, a book about transnational um, culture exchanges uh, during the Cold War. And it's co-edited by uh, Marek Payov from uh, University of Turku and, and by Alice Lovejoy from, uh, from the States. And, um, and also you may, um, just, just to mention, so, so this is uh, the research on computer games in Czechoslovakia is uh, sort of my previous project. Right now, I'm actually working at the University of Bergen on a new project, which is about video game monsters and monsters in video games. So, if you're interested in that and just want to chat about that later, um, you know, very happy to be talking about video game monsters as well. Okay, so I'll be looking at this, uh, the potential differences between amateur and professional game making. One of the reasons why I chose this topic is that uh, uh, I mean the culture of excellence, and especially this, the group here, here in Bergen, uh, I mean, here in Tampere, is interested in uh, production studies and, and how games are being produced. So I'm um, looking at these uh, differences. I'm, I'll be looking at infrastructure, so I mean, the context in which these games are being created at uh, how programming and making games is being framed by um, the media, for instance. Um, what's the economy behind it, uh, which would be very different in the two cases. Um, I'll be looking at authorship, at the questions of who is considered an author of a game. Also, there will be some differences, and I will be talking about what is the identity of a game as, um, as an artifact. What, uh, where does one game you know, stop being the same game when it's being converted, for instance, to other platforms. Um, I'm drawing um, on all kinds of material. A lot of it is interview material, and here you can see one of my interview subjects, um, uh, Valestino Vasili, who is the author of one of the games that I'll be talking about. But I really kind of made a point out of meeting these people in person. So I did over 40 uh, personal face-to-face -face interviews with um, people in Czechoslovakia who were, uh, I mean, now the Czech Republic, but before that Czechoslovakia, who were active in the 1980s on the homebrew programming scene. I was also drawing from um, all kinds of archival material, uh, like c computer club newsletters, and also the games. So most of the games that I'll be mentioning, and you'll see screenshots from them, most of them are still available, and you can play them with emulators, you can download them from various online repositories. So if you want to do that, just you know, if you can just ask me. I can sort of give you some links and where to find these games. Um, I'm uh, I won't be talking that much about theory, uh, but I, I just want to mention a few articles that kind of were an inspiration while I was um, working on on this particular topic of you know clones and adaptations. Um, there, there was a group in Germany uh, writing about copies, clones, and, 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 and genres. Um, um, there's, there's an article in the International Journal of Communication by, by Katzen Bachernack and, and Lisa van Essel. And also, if you're interested in the, in, in the idea of, of cloning and the idea of making conversions, there are two very nice articles um, that came out in this issue of the Well Played Journal. Uh, which is dedicated to European video games of the 1980s. So there's uh, there's one about Finland uh, by Petri Sarikoski, Jakos Wominen, and Marku Rennanen. And there's one about uh, clones 
uh, in, um, in Italy by Riccardo Fassona. Okay, so my first case will be Manic Minor, uh, which was a very famous game in the, in the early 80s. And I'll be talking about first a little bit about the context in, in, in the UK, then about how the game was made, and then we will sort of uh, uh, make, the, uh, make the journey into, into Czechoslovakia. In the second case, which will be Flappy, I will just uh, you know, go straight to the point, but here I will spend some time explaining the context. So let us look at uh, the 1980s uh, Britain. So um, initially, uh, the UK was kind of lagging behind the US and Japan in terms of uh, development of, uh, from you know, computing and also home computing and, uh, and, and the game industry. But they caught on quite fast in the early 80s. So there was, uh, there was a pretty evolved um, 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 commercial infrastructure um, of, you know, st of uh, stores where you could buy computers, so you could buy hardware, software, and so on. You could even, uh, starting it at around, I mean, around 1982 or three, you could actually buy computer games at newsstands also. So that was like a very kind of uh, elaborate distribution uh, structure. And um, there was an industry booming already around 1982. Um, Matthew Smith, uh, who is the author of Manic Meyer, uh, got his first computer in 1979. It was a TRS-80 computer, manufactured by the Tandy Corporation. And he bought it in one of these Tandy stores. Uh, Tandy was an American company, but they had a chain of stores in, chains of stores in Europe as well. And, um, one of his kind of first experiences programming and learning about programming was actually in this in these Stanley stores. This is not the actual one in Liverpool, but but he lived in Liverpool, um, and I mean it, it probably looked similar. So he would go to the tennis store as he kind of remembers, and uh, there would be a group of kids who would program on the computers that they had there in the store, and um, and they would just kind of get a culture into this you know culture of programming. They would also sometimes get small commissions from people. So they would program something from somebody for money. And those were, you know, back then, uh, they were like 12-year-old 12, 12 year kids. But you could see that, like, already at that point, they are kind of being encultured into programming as a job. So already in, the, already in the 1980s, in the early 1980s, there was this idea that you can make money programming. Uh, Matthew was a pretty eccentric person. I think you can kind of sense that from the photographs of him. Uh, but he was very smart and he was very talented as a programmer. Um, and the local company Bugbytes, um, founded in the, in the early 80s, approached him in 1981 uh, to for, and uh, they asked him to basically make games. And he started out making games for the TRS-80, but then um, this happened. Uh, the Sinclair GX Spectrum came out in 1982, which turned out to be um, a very influential and very popular computer in the UK and in many other European countries. What uh, differentiated the Sinclair ZX Spectrum from other computers like the DRS was primarily the price. It was a very cheap machine. So it started at uh, 125 um, uh, British pounds, which was very cheap for that time, much cheaper than the Commodore 64 or other machines that were available on the market at that time. Um, and this you know, popularized home computing to uh, an you know, um, extent that you know, was unforeseen before. And at that time, UK was, uh, based on kind of partial statistics, I mean, there, I, would, I, would, I would argue that uh, the, the, uh, the proliferation of home computers in people's households was the, was, the, was the highest in the UK out of all kind of Western civilized world at that time, thanks to very cheap computers uh, that were available on the market. So when this computer was becoming big, uh, Bugbyte actually bought one and they loaned it to Matthew Smith, who would then start making games for the Spectrum. Um, so he was already kind of commissioned to make games for the Spectrum. So he was still kind of like a scruffy teenager. He was about um, like 16 years old when he started to make his, you know, fame uh, his popular games. But he was also really, um, I mean, sophisticated by the whole thing. So sometimes when we look at the 1980s, we imagine that there's just kind of one guy sitting at a computer, and they were usually men, right? So uh, one guy sitting at a computer, and just that one computer, and coding like straight into the computer. But it was actually not, not really true. Matthew Smith already in uh, 1983, when he was making Manic Miner, um, he was using a pretty sophisticated 
environment, uh, I mean development, uh, development environment. So you can see that he has the TRS-80, so that's that computer. Um, and he has the spectrum right here. He has floppy disks, and uh, the spectrum didn't really use floppy disks, so he had that for the TRS. And he was, pro he was writing the code on the TRS and then feeding it using these uh, parallel cables into the spectrum um, so that he could kind of test the program while he was coding. So this was a pretty sophisticated system. He made it himself uh, with just um, uh, you know, a soldering iron and uh, it was like a homemade solution, but he was pretty sophisticated about it. The game, of which you can see a screenshot here, came out in 1983, in, in the summer of 1983. And it was almost immediately a huge hit. Um, it was um, inspired by uh, games like Donkey Kong. Uh, there was also an American game for the Atari called Miner uh, 2000 and 49er. Uh, and both of these influenced, uh, influenced the design of Mag Miner. So it's a platform, uh, platformer, like an action game. You mostly jump, you avoid monsters like this guy. And you have to collect keys, and then you go to the exit, which you can see here. And this is how well, all levels in this game unfold. Um, there is um, kind of a really interesting sense of humor to the whole game. For instance, when you die, when you lose all, all the lives, uh, this kind of Mon Monty Python-esque foot kind of descends on the player and kind of crushes him. And it's just like one of the, one of the small jokes. In one of the levels, uh, you, um, I mean, the enemies are these mutant telephones, and you have these mutant toilets, and it's just, uh, it's just like a lot of, a lot of in jokes, and a lot of small kind of fun touches. Uh, when the game came out, uh, it was welcomed uh, by the gaming press, which was also already quite evolved in 1983 in the UK. Uh, the re reviewers said that it had impressive graphics, highly original scenarios, original, amusing, and that it was original, amusing, and habit-forming. And that was actually considered like a good thing. Um, and it had humor, horror, and wholesome addiction, if that exists. Uh, and back then, you know, in the 1980s, especially in the British press, the word addictive was used as a, as a positive adjective. Um, so if a game was addictive, it was good. Manic Miner came out as a commercial product. Where you, could, you could buy it at a store, you could buy it at a newsstand. Um, it, was, it was put out on a cassette tape. So here you can see the spectrum versions, um, and here you can see the tapes. Uh, it was also then um, kind of officially re-released um, for other platforms, for the Amstrad and you know, for, for other platforms. So there were some conversions uh, being done in-house. Um, Matthew Smith actually I mean, made a lot of money on this game. So first, I mentioned that uh, he was hired by Bugbyte Software. But uh, Bugbyte Software was kind of slow on paying him royalties, so he took the game with him and uh, you know kind of helped uh, by a lawyer. He kind of created his own company, uh, Software Projects. You can see the logo here. So uh, he created his own company and published the game again, almost the same game, and, and that's where kind of the money started rolling again for him. And he knew that he had a hit on his hands and really kind of wanted to kind of capitalize on that. And he also had some kind of outside help from lawyers and uh, from um, his kind of entrepreneur friends and so on. So this game was a commercial product that was protected by copyright. And uh, Matthew Smith was also kind of covered by the gaming magazines at that time. And um, he was, his persona was constructed as this kind of programming rock star. Um, there was, um, yeah, they call him the Merchant of Mayhem. Um, I think that um, there is a, there's a clear precedent to this kind of approach to kind of creative professionals, and that is British music magazines, right? So they, uh, they present him in a way that you know, music magazines were used to uh, portraying musicians, uh, you know, rock musicians and punk rock musicians. Um, so he became this, uh, uh, this, this kind of persona. You can see here on the left is actually an illust illustration from uh, the Sinclair User Magazine in 1984. Um, and it is, this is sort of like a pastiche or a parody of uh, the cover of his second game, uh, second game, you know, the sequel to Manic Miner called Jet Set Willy. Um, and it, the, the cover is some, something like this, but here you can see instead of the, the character Willy, so this guy, I forgot to mention that, this guy is called Miner Willy, he's the main character. 
But instead of Will, you can see Matthew Smith here. Um, what the press wrote about him. He is now the most famous programmer in the country, the embodiment of the otherwise spurious Smith of the school millionaire. And what he said about himself, I like partying, getting drunk, and falling over a lot. And um, so he started this kind of really kind of rock and roll lifestyle. Um, he became very frustrated with the industry and with the pressure that was put on him because he became this kind of uh, you know, rock star and everybody was looking forward to the next game. He made Jet Set Willy in 1984, the sequel to, to Man Minor, and then he was kind of employed by Software Project. I mean, he co-owned it and he, it was kind of running on for four more years, but he never made another game and he had, hasn't made any games since. And then he kind of got lost and he moved to the Netherlands and he worked kind of manual jobs in like a fish factory or something in the Netherlands. And he, he had, like his life story is really interesting. He was like this hero and victim of the, the early game industry in a way. Um, Manic Miner was immensely influential. Uh, it sort of co-created a, a variation of the platformer genre that was uh, popular on the 8-bit 8 8 computers. And there were games like, and, and you know, you can just see by the by the titles. I mean, they, they were inspired not only like the, not only the genre was similar, but also the titles, Dynamite Dan, and Mountie Mole. I mean, there were different characters, but the gameplay was pretty much uh, pretty much the same or very similar. They introduced new characters, they introduced kind of new settings, but the basics were the same. But still, I mean, uh, it was a copyrighted program, so they couldn't just like, you know, make Manic Miner 2, right? That was possible. Okay, so now let's move to Czechoslovakia. It was a country behind the Iron Curtain, obviously. Um, which, I mean, had uh, several kind of effects on the development of computing there. Uh, so one thing is that computers were not really easily available, um, and uh, neither was software. So there was no hardware or software market, and there were um, these barriers to the trade with the West. Um, you couldn't just go into a store and buy a Sinclair ZX Spectrum. Um, um, it was more, more, more difficult. Uh, the country was producing some of its own computers, uh, especially the PMD85 will be important for our story in a bit. Um, the IQ151 and the PMD85 were computers that were manufactured in Czechoslovakia, but they were not sold in stores. They were sold directly to institutions, um, so directly to schools or sometimes also uh, computer clubs that we'll be talking about in a minute. Uh, both of these computers that were kind of, I mean, had some uh, kind of impact in Czechoslovakia were kind of uh, inferior uh, to the machines that were produced in the West at that time. Because, um, I mean, most of the Soviet, I mean, the entire Soviet bloc was lagging behind the West in terms of uh, computing technology. Um, but um, still, people wanted to get hold of Western technology. I mean, and those, and, and, as I, and I said that the Czech, uh, Czechoslovak computers weren't really available uh, for you to buy. So what people did was that either uh, they went to these like special stores with imported goods, um, and uh, you know, they waited in long lines for like the very few computers uh, that were imported. This is actually a line for color TVs, but uh, a line for computers would be very similar. Or uh, they could kind of travel to the west and buy the computer there, but not everybody could do that. Um, you had a, you had to have a special permit. Um, it was not easy at all. But I mean, people would kind of find a relative or a friend who was permitted to travel to the west, and then they would bring computers over or games. Um, so um, um, so 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 there would be like a pretty big user base of Western computers in the country. Um, so I said that uh, Czechoslovakia was kind of lagging behind the West in a way, but at the same time the government was supporting programming and computing, especially uh, in terms of programming education. Uh, they uh, kind of wanted to educate these young programmers then, who would then kind of work in uh, their jobs in you know, state-owned factories or institutions and so on, or in the army. So the goal was not really to create a game industry or a software industry. The, the goal was to educate them so that then they are kind of hired by these kind of state-owned companies. 
But still, there was support for, uh, for programming, and um, uh, the state subsidized computer clubs, uh, which were affiliated either with schools or with paramilitary organizations, or, um, or with uh, kind of some, some kind of youth organizations. Here you can see a picture from one of those. It's the Station of Technicians in Prague. And you can see the grammar school student, Franciszek Fuka, uh, yeah, the guy who's standing, showing his friends at the Station of Technicians his own new creation, a computer game. And this is from 1986. And, uh, and by then, you know, he's already made a few games, and his friends have already made some games. Uh, what you cannot really see here that well is that they're using a Synchro ZX Spectrum. You can kind of tell it by its size. Uh, because it was a very, very tiny uh, computer. And um, the Spectrum was very popular in the country, and one of the reasons uh, why Spectrum was being imported from the West was that it was very, very tiny, it was like, like this big. Um, so it could be quite easily smuggled, because the, uh, otherwise you'd have to pay customs fees that were pretty high. So what people did, and I've been, I've been uh, told this in, in some interviews, that you would uh, kind of, uh, for instance, like buy a box of chocolates and eat the chocolates and uh, put the spectrum into the box of chocolates. And then you would kind of pretend that, you know, I haven't opened this box of chocolates and you would just like be uh, led through the, through the borders without paying the customs fees. Or you could also kind of bribe the customs officials, right? That was also possible. So the spectrum um, was, in, was being imported individually by people traveling from the West into the country. And soon there was a pretty large community, uh, about tens of thousands of users, which is quite a lot. And um, um, with uh, the spectrum, with the hardware, also um, you know, software started to flow into the country. And um, I mean, the question is how Manic Miner as a game actually made it into the country. So I, I showed you uh, the cassette tapes I think that at this, um, in 1983, I think the most likely option was that somebody who was you know, buying a computer in the West just bought you know, a few cassettes with games, and then they brought it into the country with them. Later, uh, there were kind of more sophisticated um, I guess systems of distribution. Uh, so starting in around 1985, most of the software actually kind of traveled through either Poland or Yugoslavia uh, to Czechoslovakia um, in pirated copies. So no, no original copies were transferred into the country. But in 1983 still, I would, based on interviews and um, all kinds of materials, I would, I would sort of expect that somebody actually brought a physical copy from the West into one of those clubs. And then it started spreading. Um, and um, just like in the West um, or in the UK, People in Czechoslovakia loved Man and Miner. So you could see that in the, um, in the memories of players who were active in the 1980s, they say that it was absolutely legendary. It was a classic. Um, and also in preserved published materials, we can see that already in 1985, one of the computer club newsletters uh, says that it's a classic game. So it was two years after it was, uh, it was put out, which makes it almost an instant classic. So it was just as popular in Czechoslovakia as it was in the UK. But at the same time, people in Czechoslovakia didn't really know that much about the business uh, the, of, of game industry in the UK. So what you would get is a copy of a game um, you know, on tape. You wouldn't have the original kind of paratextual material. You wouldn't have the packaging. You didn't know, uh, you know that much about the company that made it. You might know a little bit about the author. Like the information would kind of filter through you know, kind of many kind of mediators into the country. Uh, so you were left with kind of very limited information about the genesis of the game and about the workings of the game industry. So what one of the interviewees told me, we knew that Manic Miner was written by a 15-year-old. What we didn't know was that he made money on it, started to drink and do drugs, and read himself. We, or at least I, didn't see the business behind it because we didn't know about it. Uh, and the f funny fact here is that he wasn't even 15 years old. Um, he, was, he was actually older when he made the game. So Matthew Smith was about 17 years old when he made the game, which is young you know, to create a software blockbuster. But still, it's not 15. And this kind of myth of um, 
of Matthew Smith as this kind of uh, young genius, like this boy who creates games, was kind of very prevalent in Czechoslovakia. And I think it kind of had something to do with the support for um, for, for youth groups that that taught programming. He was kind of put forward as this role model of a guy who aged 15, or some people even said 14. He made this amazing game, and you can be like him. Right? So he was this. Uh, he became this role model, like very much untrue um, to his um, status in the UK, where he was seen like as a, as a total rock star, and then uh, like uh, as a kind of total has been. Um, so. Um, the, the, the context in Czechoslovakia was very different, and the act of making games was uh, uh, was seen differently and framed differently. And uh, games like Manic Miner were not primarily seen as commercial products, but as sort of like mm, things to explore. Uh, hacking was very much encouraged uh, because uh, I mean most of these most of this activity took place in these uh, these non-commercial, non-profit, uh, kind of state-sponsored clubs. And what they thought was programming, and games were seen as sort of like this raw material that you can do something with, and you can kind of learn programming by analyzing these games. Uh, this is a quote from 1988, but I think like that it kind of encaps enca encapsulates the kind of spirits. Uh, but I, um, I think that this approach kind of started much earlier in 1988. They write only a few programs are polished into the state of perfection, attractiveness, and user-friendliness to the extent that computer games are. I do think that beginners should delve into simple games and take them apart. An extra extraordinarily suitable game is, for example, the good old Manic Miner, written by a 15-year-old. Again, we can see that they kind of represent his age. Um, so yeah, people were uh, encouraged to, to kind of uh, play around with those games. And I kind of have I have a question about time because we started like ten minutes later. So we're on to like fifteen. Something. Yeah. So uh, so they were doing all kinds of modifications with these games. So they were uh, poking, which meant like doing these simple hacks um, that had the effect, for example, of like adding infinite lives or you know all kinds of gameplay quirks. They made conversions and ports. They did mashups and imitations. Right. Uh, kind of uh, outline these uh, um, these categories now, and I will talk about each of them in a bit. And I just want to uh, say one thing that I kind of personally consider important, and that is that a conversion is not a port. So when games are being transferred from one computer platform to another, or game platform to another, um, they're often called ports, um, but uh, and sometimes they're called conversions. And I think it's important to distinguish these uh, between these. Um, I talked about conversions when it's a game that is supposed to like, kind of represent the original, but it's programmed from scratch. Whereas port is uh, just taking the original code and modif modifying it, in, uh, you know, like to to some extent, so that it works on the target machine. It's not just uh, starting with a blank slate and programming the game from scratch. Um, the, first conver the first conversion made in Czechoslovakia for, uh, um, um, of Manic Miner came out already in 1984. So it was less than a year after it was released uh, in the UK. So you can imagine that I mean, it must have taken some time, you know, weeks or months for the game to get into the country. And then in the summer of <coughs> 1984, uh, a conversion for the ZX81 uh, already came out. It was, it was uh, made by Aleš Martinik, who was a student of the Brno University of Technology. And, um, and it, was, it was quite an achievement. He says, my motivation was 20% the desire to play Manic Miner, even though I only had a ZX81. And the remaining 80% was the desire to prove to myself, but mainly others, that I'm good enough to pull it off, at both of which I succeeded. So you can see that there's this kind of motivation by the showing off this economy, economy of prestige, right? Like uh, getting credit for making something. You, although it's just a conversion, it doesn't matter, but you really did something important. You brought uh, this game in onto the ZX81, which was an inferior computer. And it was, uh, it, was very, it was very hard to pull off, uh, to create a game that played almost the same. Just like this. Um, so in the end, if we look at the conversions and ports, uh, three different versions of the game were made in Czechoslovakia. Uh, conversions, at least three. 
So the ZX81, for the PMD85, the computer that I've shown you before, and for Sharp MZ800, we'll talk about it a little bit later. Um, you can see that, I mean, there are some uh, interesting differences here. Can you, can you spot differences? <laughs> Okay, so this is uh, this is high score. Oh, okay. But but I mean, yeah, the other, so the original, which is here, uh, doesn't show the high score. I mean, shows the high score, but that one doesn't, and that one doesn't either. Yeah, and that one does. Yeah, so that's that's one dif that's one difference. Does the one for the PMD have an inventory because it says Etsy? Yeah. Get the things. Yeah, yeah. That you uh, so somebody knows check. <laughs> um, uh, no, well, it doesn't have an inventory. Uh, you just collect the keys as you did on, in the original version. But I mean, in the original version, it didn't it didn't tell you how many you have collected. This is kind of I don't think it really serves any kind of important gameplay function. But the display of the PME was kind of um, the aspect ratio was different, so I think they kind of felt the need to kind of put something there, perhaps. But there is actually one, um, okay, so let me say one thing. So this is um, kind of the initial uh, moment in the game. So assume that you haven't lost any lives yet. So the difference in, in lives. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think that's, that's kind of saying something interesting, right? So in the original, you have three lives, including the one on the screen. And here you have eight, and there you have six, and six. Um, so the game is kind of considerably kind of less difficult um, in the Czechoslovak versions, which um, I mean is a reaction to the pretty high difficulty of the original. Back then, you know, games were kind of still shaped by the kind of arcade game conventions of difficulty, and I mean that meant very difficult. Um, and at the same time, it was very common for people to kind of add lives by poking, by sort of hacking the game. So I I would kind of assume that the number of lives was not really considered a uh, feature that would kind of define gameplay. Uh, it didn't really kind of matter that much because you could always kind of, you know, have infinite lives anyway. Um, so this kind of made the game a little bit more playable. And of course, I mean, there are some differences um, uh, in graphics that kind of reflected uh, the features of the individual platforms. Um, also, uh, what you can see here is the translations. So people would translate the names of the of the individual levels into into Czech or Slovak based on or what what their uh, language was. Um, I have a I just show a bit of gameplay um, of the original and then of one of the conversions. And there is uh, there is one more kind of important difference here. So we don't have sound. I mean the sound is. Not that important. So, so this is one of the kind of most famous levels, and I'll just pull it to so you can see all the platforming action. I'll just pull it a little bit, so you can see that minor really is just jumping up there, and this is the alien Kong beast, and by switching this lever. You kind of trigger the scripted action, and the Kong beast kind of falls down. Whereas in one of the conversions, you can see that there's just like no Kong beast at all, uh, and this kind of shows some of kind of some 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 of the limits of these conversions. Um, um, basically, what they did was they converted or they rewrote the engine of the game. But whenever there was like scripted sequence that was unique. It was much harder for people to actually code these specific occurrences, these kind of unique, uh, uh, unique elements in, in the individual levels. So sometimes they just kind of gave up. So there's uh, there's no copies here, which really kind of changes the gameplay of this particular level. I mean, otherwise you can see that it is actually pretty. I'm sorry, I'm I keep skipping, but. Otherwise, you can see that it's actually pretty faithful. And this is a conversion. It was written from scratch. So you can see, I mean, they must have known the original game very well. 
uh, to, to make something that I mean, feels so similar. Uh, the names of the levels were sometimes mistranslated um, and in funny ways. So in the original game, there is a, uh, there's a level called The Warehouse, which is translated as <laughs> Warehouse. Uh, Dumbake for the Czech uh, speaking, uh, speaking um, audience members. Menagerie, which kind of features these animals kind of running around, is translated as Mind Management, or uh, Sprava Banje in, uh, in Slovak. Endorian Forest, which is clearly um, a reference to what? Star Wars. Yeah. Uh, Star Wars wasn't really, um, I mean, some people obviously knew about it in Czechoslovakia in the 1980s, but it was actually never shown in movie theaters until 1991. Um, so, I mean, a lot of people just didn't know this reference, and they just translated it as Forbidden Forest. And the VAT, which kind of doesn't really make much sense. I mean, they mean, yeah. Um, even in the original, I'm, I'm kind of wondering why it's called the VAT, and they just uh, very descriptively uh, <laughs> translate it as the cannon and the three kangaroos, because there are three kangaroos. <laughs> So you can see that people, like, although they're kind of remaking a game that already exists, they're always kind of inserting like, their own takes on the game, their interpretation of the content, their, kind of, their take on the difficulty of the game, and their kind of, um, take on what is important and what's not, or what's doable or what's not. Um, there were not only conversions, but also mashups, so games that are kind of taking bits of the original game, but making something kind of different with it. So this was this, this game called the Willy Walker, of also called the PND, or a game confusingly called Manic Miner from 1987, which is completely different. So you you have, I mean, the Miner Willy is there, right? You can see him, but the gameplay is completely different. Like, like you can see the ladders and kind of the poles that you can climb, and uh, it, it plays completely differently, but it's called Manic Miner, because you can do that if you're in Czechoslovakia, and copyright means nothing. Um, it's interesting to look at how um, the original author was credited. Um, so, I mean, people, Matthew Smith was one of the kind of few famous programmers that people kind of knew some things about. Even though, I mean, you couldn't get uh, British magazines in Czechoslovakia, but people kind of knew about Matthew Smith. And he was also, um, uh, his name was in the original game. So, in, uh, in this uh, conversion, what they said uh, was, Authors, and you know, Vitebolitsky and Daniel Lena, the guys who programmed the, the conversion, screenplay and shapes Matthew Smith, uh, which I think is an interesting way of uh, creating Matthew Smith. I mean, he did create the scenarios, he created uh, the graphics, but they uh, considered themselves authors. Because in the 80s, in Czechoslovakia, but also to some extent in the West, authorship was very much associated with authorship of the program, not really the design, but the program. Um, in one of these mashups, you can read that it's from foreign materials adapted and written by Karel Shuhaida. And he doesn't specify which foreign materials, but it's obvious that it's uh, games by Matthew Smith. And there were also imitations. Um, I'll go through the second case very fast. Um, there's just one point that I want to show to you. Um, so Flappy, like Manic Miner, was a very influential game in, uh, in Czechoslovakia, and that was for one reason. It was because of this machine, Sharp MZ800. It was one of the few computers that you could actually buy in Czechoslovakia, in the, starting in mid-80s. And that was because of the deal that Czechoslovak government made with the Japanese government. And reportedly, and I'm, I mean, this is sort of like apoc apocryphal, but uh, the explanation that I get often is that the shipment of these computers was exchanged with Japan for a shipment of wooden spoons. Uh, and thanks to this deal, uh, the Sharp MZ800, a computer that was popular nowhere else, became popular than Japan and Czechoslovakia, became popular in the country. And, and with it, the game Flappy, which is uh, this kind of action puzzle hybrid in which you, uh, are you familiar with Boulder Dash? It's a bit similar, so uh, this character here kind of pushes these stones and he has to push the blue one onto, onto this, this kind of blue slot. So, um, so that's the goal of the game. Vasil Vasily uh, remade the game. Once again, uh, it, uh, he was sort of um, motivated by sort of showing off. It was a bet of sorts. Bet you wouldn't pull that off, and I said I would. Um, he replaced 
the original credit with his own credits or with the credit of his collective, VBG Software. And in 1987, he published his game. It is remarkably, remarkably uh, faithful. But there is one important difference, um, which I will document right now. So you can, you can see the original Flappy character from the original game. Um, what, what kind of animal do you think uh, that is? Well, that's, uh, that's, a, that's an interesting answer. <laughs> Um, yeah, you were not the you were not you're not the only one who thought it was a chicken. Yeah, looks like a kiwi from the um, New Zealand story Amiga game, which came later. That's yeah. quite a bit of re resemblance. Yeah, um, I mean, it's hard to say because it's very pixelated. But um, <laughs> in the original game, it was supposed to be a mall. So you can see that this is like uh, the revision of the mall on the paratexts of the original game. So it's on the packaging. But uh, Vlastimil Vasily, who made the Czech version, actually also thought that it was a chicken. And uh, so, so this was arms, right? Like, on, on, obviously, on the, in the original. So he's just like kind of shuffling his arms like this when he's walking around. Uh, but um, <laughs> as you can see in the conversion, Vlastimil Vasily actually kind of remade that as wings. Um, and he, because he didn't have access to the original paratextual information, um, he even kind of made up his own story that he inserted in the game. He's, and the story, the instruction of the game says, help the chicken called Flappy get the white egg onto the white platform. Um, and you can, uh, so it's in, reinterpreted as a chicken. And you can even see that in the, on the loading screen of the game, you can, you can see Flappy um, um, on these sort of uh, castle battlements. What is the original game, when you look at the manuals, like they're set in this uh, kind of mine complex somewhere on like an alien planet or something. But uh, Vesely situates the game on a castle, which can also make sense because then that's, that's, that, that is the kind of environment that when you grew up in Czechoslovakia, that's like something that you see like almost everywhere, like castles everywhere. So he set it in a castle. So once again, like what he kind of didn't know, he replaced with his own interpretation of what he thought the game was about. And there were more versions of Flappy. Okay, so uh, let's get to the conclusion. Um, this uh, this kind of approach to you know original game artifacts was not uh, what, not unique to these titles. Um, people were kind of borrowing characters and borrowing sprites and borrowing graphics and, and pieces of program from you know from uh, from um, uh, from Western software. Uh, Indiana Jones uh, became a popular character in uh, Czechoslovak games, and of course, like none of these games with Indiana Jones were licensed. Um, one of the chapters in the book deals with uh, activist games uh, that protested um, communist regime, and that's not what we're talking about right now. But I just want to point out that there's this um, that even in these games, people were borrowing from existing Western games. So this is a loading screen of uh, a game called. 17 11, 1989, and it's about the Velvet Revolution in Czechoslovakia. And it was, it was released uh, two days after uh, the demonstrations. And uh, the loading screen is actually just a redrawn <laughs> loading screen of the way of the exploding fist. So, so once, you, once again, you can see that people are treating Western games as this raw material with which they can kind of work and uh, of which they can create bricolages in their own work. Um, we've seen Similarities between amateurs and professionals. I mean, there were young people. Um, most of them, I mean, started started out as you know, like with you know, no money, as like a sort of bedroom operations. Uh, but in the West, I mean, you could become big and you could become famous and you know rich. But I mean, you could also become victim of the of the computer industry. Whereas in, in Czechoslovakia, it was all kind of non-profit amateur work. There were differences in infrastructure. Uh, so on the one hand, you have software houses. On the other, um, uh, non-profit, state-sponsored uh, clubs. Program was framed as, you know, on the one hand, being like a rock star. On the other hand, you know, being educated to become this kind of wholesome kind of programmer figure in a state industry. In the West, um, um, like most of the motivation for creating games and for the industry to flourish was. You know, I mean, commercial uh, profit, whereas in Czechoslovakia it was prestige. Um, authorship was viewed differently, uh, and copyright 
uh, the lack of copyright protection in most of Eastern Europe actually kind of uh, contributed to the fact that there were like all these different um, kinds of conversion sports and mashups, and nobody really, no, nobody really could do anything about it because um, um, the Western companies didn't have power or any kind of motivation to litigate uh, with amateurs in Czechoslovakia, for instance. And we've seen some um, uh, some kind of ideas about what constitutes an identity of the game. Right? Uh, so is it still the same game if we take out uh, you know, the, the Kong Beast? I mean, some people thought that it was. Uh, I think this wouldn't really be permissible if it was like an official conversion um, kind of sanctioned by, by, uh, by software projects. Yeah, and that's, that's it for me. Uh, I'll be uh, happy to answer your questions. Thank you so much. So if we're going a bit over time, we started a bit later. So. Yeah. yeah, so we can take a couple of questions, I think. And uh, just, just we'll ask you to repeat the question mm -hmm. for the stream. Sure. So. Any questions? Yeah? So there was absolutely zero economic motivation for that. I mean, they, they didn't have any possibility to get like economic return from this activity in communist Czechoslovakia. Uh, that is true, yeah. Can you just like... Okay, so the question was, if uh, there was no way of uh, people getting money for making games in Czechoslovakia, no, they couldn't. Uh, there were some differences. Um, it was not the whole Soviet bloc was like that. So in Poland, for instance, um, there were a few small, tiny kind of companies that would, kind of organizations that would publish games that you could buy. In Hungary, uh, it was similar, but Czechoslovakia was actually one of the most restrictive in, in these terms, so you couldn't actually enterprise on your own. It was just impossible legally. You might, you might have probably got, I don't know, like kind of pocket money from somebody, you know, just like as, a, as a, like a thank you or something, or um, informally. I mean, there were pirates already back then, so who would sell games for money, but they would make much more money selling Western games than domestic games. Uh, was this game development culture in Czechoslovakia, Czechoslovakia very different from the neighboring uh, Soviet bloc countries? Mm -hmm. Or was there sim what, were, what were kind of like the similarities or differences? Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so the question was uh, whether in other countries in the Soviet bloc, the game development culture was uh, similar or different. Um, so there were the context was usually very similar. Uh, so in most uh, Soviet bloc countries, you would have uh, computer clubs as like the prominent hubs of uh, computer of programming activities um, for eight-bit computers. So that, so that would be the same. But in terms of what games are were being made, I think there are some differences, and I think it has to do with the fact that. Uh, these countries were, to a large extent, kind of isolated. These cultures were kind of isolated from each other. There wasn't that much kind of travel between different countries. Not as, not, it was not nearly as globalized as today. So what emerged were some kind of national trends in a way. So in Czechoslovakia, for example, the activist games, kind of the anti-regime games, were quite unique. And I haven't kind of seen any examples in any other country. But it might be the case of just like somebody making the first one, and then you know other people kind of copy it. Um, so you could you could kind of see these patterns kind of emerging in different countries um, because the communities were pretty tight and they were um, basically kind of copying each other. Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah, so the question was uh, whether um, after the Velvet Revolution the attitudes to copyright changed. Um, yeah, so it changed, um, uh, the law changed. Um, so the uh, copyright for software was introduced in 1991, if I'm correct. Um, it's in the book, <laughs> just, uh, yeah, just kind of blanking out. I think it was 1991. It was actually earlier than in some other Eastern European countries. And already in uh, in 1990, small publishers kind of emerged who were publishing 
uh, original games uh, for them. And um, so they would be like this, um, like a very kind of short kind of, um, kind of moment when uh, games for 8-bit computers were being sold commercially. And then it kind of, uh, you know, kind of moved on into 16-bit computers. But even then, um, some of the games were uh, kind of unadmitted conversions. Um, even in 1992, there was a game called um, Atomics uh, uh, that was released commercially for the Spectrum in Czechoslovakia, and it was a conversion of an Amiga game. Um, and I don't think there was any litigation or anything. Um, I think that maybe at that time still the idea of copyright was so much kind of focused on the authorship of the program that they might have said we programmed this version so it's actually our work um, so so they might have been kind of thinking that so it was it was kind of gradual and I don't think people were kind of penalized harshly even after the law changed it, it, it really took some years um, and I, into the 1990s, piracy was like the default way of getting games. It's changed since then, I think. Yeah. Any more questions or comments? Yeah, if I may, uh, it's always interesting to see this kind of uh, sort of comparisons, uh, mm -hmm. cross cultural. Mm -hmm. uh, things in digital culture and game, games culture. Uh, one of the things that we are constantly sort of uh, looking for is this kind of national cultural differences and whether there are some unique characteristics in, in certain cultures mm -hmm. that uh, do not exist elsewhere. Uh, this talk was uh, really fascinating. I'm looking forward to reading uh, the book. Uh, the thing seems to be that, uh, from Finnish perspective that we don't have this kind of uh, games so much based on the national epic of uh, Finnish people or anything like that. We have Angry Birds and we have Max Payne, we have influences taken from uh, the Hong Kong action cinema or from uh, Disney cartoons. So do you see uh, in terms of the actual gaming content mm -hmm. anything that is uh, sort of Czechoslovakian or, yeah. or related to the national roots or is it basically uh, this kind of uh, amateur aesthetics and exploitation of the opportunities mm. and uh, that kind of questions that are uh, so the cultural context is more interesting than actual the cultural concept mm -hmm. yeah the, so the question was whether um, there were any kind of specific patterns in content in Czechoslovak games that were related to Czechoslovak culture um, and um, and I think, uh, so this, I was talking about kind of one kind of segment, which were conversion of ports, and then there were like a lot of original stuff. Um, um, and much of that was inspired by Western games because they were very influential. So I mean, and Western content. So there, the, these Indiana Jones games, right? Like they were super popular. Um, but at the same time, there were games that were based on, uh, um, I mean, Czech or Slovak culture. So there was a pretty popular game called Pouch the Beetle, or Hrobak Trublik in Slovak, or Brok Pitlik in Czech, um, which was based on, a, on like a Czech children's story. Uh, or there were games based on Czech history, like taking place in castles, of course. Um, uh, there were games, I actually had a, a slide, like this uh, on, the, on the bottom left, is an adaptation of the Czech version of Tic-Tac-Toe. And the Czech version of Tic-Tac-Toe is called Piškorky, and it's, and it's not played on three by three um, grid, but it's played on an like infinite grid. If you have enough graph paper, it can be infinite. Um, so, um, so, so um, conversions or adaptation, digital adaptations of that, like were very popular because it was a very popular kind of uh, non-digital game, and versions of it in digital, in, like digital, were uh, were also very popular. Um, then there are like if we go a bit later, uh, there are games like uh, Samorost uh, by Amanita Design, which is, I mean, it doesn't use language, you wouldn't, I mean, I don't know how many people would say it was Czech, but it like pretty clearly follows in the tradition of Czech animation of the 60s and 70s, but just by the way it's done, uh, it's made, right? the, the graphics are made. And today, uh, one of the biggest hits coming from the country is Kingdom Come Deliverance, which actually takes place 
in the Bohemia, like in the four, in the fifth, early fifteenth century, um, and they I think now the way they're thinking sometimes about uh, these settings is that it's uh, kind of exotic in a way, right? So how do you differentiate from other RPG games you know, by setting it in another country like Bohemia in the in the in the fourteen hundreds? So yeah, so it's been. Um, I think there's this kind of tension, and I think it kind of goes uh, goes there and back all the time. Like sometimes, yeah, people just copy Western sources, and other times, they look for inspiration in the national culture. More questions? Yeah. Oh, there's one more. <laughs> Was there any uh, particular character or or? Or game that was kind of like very uh, Czechoslovakian in some sense, or just kind of like a famous that was not uh -huh. aware or something like that. Yeah, so that that's a good question, and I I think I kind of have maybe two uh, from the eighties. So about just sir, just repeat the question. Okay, the question was if there was a character or a particular game that were uh, specifically Czechoslovak that was influential or famous. So I think I would. I think I'm online, yeah. So I can, I can show. There was one game that was um, that was very popular. Okay, yeah. Um, it's like this comedic um, text adventure game, Shatohim. Uh, it's I mean it's written in Cyrillic, but the game is Slovak, and it's it's about this heroic uh, Soviet uh, soldier who's. Uh, goal in the game is to kill John Rambo. So you can see that there is there is this kind of inspiration by by Western sources, but at the same time, you know, by Soviet kind of block sources. And it's the, it's sort of a parodic uh, parodic game, um, and um, it's made to seem very kind of pro-Soviet. But at the same time, um, there are many scenes in the game, especially like when you fail, when the main character, the heroic Soviet soldier, is kind of humiliated and kind of killed in different ways. And that was the that's the way in which this particular game is subversive. Uh, it's a, it's a very kind of like well written funny game. And another game that from that era that is okay, that is still still actually being played and that was influential throughout the whole Soviet bloc is Tetris 2 by Fuchsoft. By actually the guy that you saw showing the game to the rest of the people in the computer club, he created. In 1990, he started working on it uh, a bit earlier, the unofficial sequel to Tetris, and he kind of he credits very diligently the original authors of the game, and and you know the game says you know this is just a variation of the amazing game Tetris made by these Soviet programmers and so on, and uh, it's like a two-player competitive version of Tetris, and I think that to this day it's the best version of Tetris I've ever played. So I totally recommend uh, this game, and it has amazing music, which kind of mixes uh, Soviet and, and uh, Czech folk songs. You cannot hear it now. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Uh, I think that we're at the end of the lecture, and like for, for people who want to continue discussing these things, we will have a reading certain session uh, in like a. 15 minutes more or less, and we'll be discussing a chapter from Aristotle's new book. So people included in the reading circle probably have already got those the chapter, but yeah, I think anyone can participate because it is in a way connected to, to the lecture that Aristotle gave right now. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you.